I realized something just now that the longer I put off doing an episode, the more and more trepidatious I feel about making an episode. And I don't have anything that's really attracting me to speak about it um, out in that internet, internet land um, to criticize or to you know, necessarily share the opposite of uh, criticization. But I need to get myself out there. I need to keep myself out there just so I know that I, it, I this is something I can still do. So we'll talk about this past weekend. Um, I went down to Portland and I had a Centre Salon A or a Moderate Meetup A or just a moderate meetup. And we met at the Lucky Labrador and I met this wonderful man who's uh, Portland famous, which is a thing. I mean, you can be internet famous and then you can be Twitter famous um, and then you can be academic famous and then you can be Portland famous. And this wonderful man, Andy No, is down in Portland and he's uh, basically chronicling the uh, shenanigans that happen in there, specifically about maybe about free spe speech issues, maybe about free speech issues, or about, I guess he chronicled Antifa, who was outside of the Jordan Peterson rally. What? No, Jordan Peterson doesn't have rallies. He has lectures. Antifa has rallies. Jordan Peterson has talks or lectures. And Andy was out there taking pictures. But uh, I got to sit down with him and, and we spoke a lot about his ongoing um, move towards making podcasts and, and uh, you know, what I've been doing and, and thinking about how I can, uh, you know, make a footprint in this growing um, kind of movement, uh, not, a, not a political movement or ideological movement, but the movement of people just creating content for other people to consume on demand. And we'll get to that because that's what Jordan Peterson talked about on Monday, which was last night. But on Saturday, we had our moderate meetup and I got to meet a lot of uh, really cool folk in Portland. And one of the one of the refrains that I heard about the people who showed up to the Centre Salone was that they had been Several people said I was a good progressive, and then things got weird. Um, so it's, it's really interesting to see this uh, this red pill phenomenon happen, where you know a lot of us during the George W. Bush era were strongly anti-war uh, and saw the way that the Republican executive branch was acting, and were rather upset by the lying and the scheming that was going on on the level of Karl Rove and the level of, you know, Dick Cheney and then the level of George W. Bush, um, who's apparently uh, something, somebody that we can feel good about now that we're dealing with um, the person who's turned up the rhetoric even more in that office um, without necessarily turning up the scheming in any sort of uh, incredibly in uh, intentional way. I'm talking about Trump. I really don't think he's intentional, but I'm not going to bitch about Trump. I've said that before, and we'll get to that later because that's what Jordan Peterson said on Monday. So we had this great Century Salon, and then it, then that was on Sunday, and then Monday, which was last night, I went to the Jordan Peterson um, talk at the Keller Auditorium. But before we did that, me and my friends, we went down to the ICE place where ICE, I-C-E, uh, the uh, customs exportation, individual custom or uh, exportation, exploitation initiative. Oh yeah, the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement um, deployment. And in Portland, there's this Office of Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and that had been blockaded last Sunday. Uh, so about a week and a day or two days ago. And there was a blockade and they kind of stopped the ICE employees from entering and exiting the building. And then it kind of, uh, they were told to disperse and they didn't disperse these protesters. And they ended up taking, uh, taking over this kind of this alleyway next to the ICE camp. And then they built like this barrier of wood and tarps and signs all over the place. And uh, they, they're camping out and they've organized kind of like this, this, uh, this camp ground and they have security and communications and people donating food they have a shower now and a daycare and apparently the operation itself is uh, was pretty uh, impressive from one of my organizationally minded friends um, and you know we poked around we watched them have a, a general assembly and the general assembly was pretty interesting I could feel that they what they really want is 
for ice to be disbanded because ice apparently is i don't know the entire thing i don't want to talk too much about what exactly ice does other than ensuring or, or going around and making sure that that united states citizens are united states citizens are the people who belong in this country the people who do not belong in this country quote unquote the people who do not belong in this country are processed and either given the ability to belong in this country or forced to leave. Now, the contentious, the contentious issue with belonging in this country is a very interesting and textured moral debate. The people who believe that everybody belongs here uh, are kind of driven, I think they're kind of driven, basically by compassion. They think that there's no such thing as an illegal human. They think that we have all this prosperity, we need to share it. If somebody wants to come here at risk of life and limb, then they should have the right to be here. Now, you know, the, the issue gets really complex because, you know, United States, we allow in uh, 60 or 600,000 uh, immigrants a year officially, and we have 1 million people coming here illegally. Uh, every year and those people are skipping in line and plus you know if we just open the floodgates what happens when the certain elements of another culture come in how do we integrate these people how do we provide for these people and it's it's a very nuanced debate but the people at this ice you know it's not a protest if it lasts for a week and a half uh, this ice uh, uh what is it this ice installation this, this protest installation. They, we talked to them, me and my friends, we talked to them, and basically they just want ICE to be disbanded. They just basically want ICE to be disbanded. And I don't know if that's gonna happen or not. Um, and I think it seems like the feds are taking their time on, uh, instead of arresting them, just saying like, if you do this, this is gonna happen. You have to clear out of this doorway and that doorway. And then they, the ICE protesters, they obliged. Uh, but they still are there and the ICE offices are in kind of like a semi-operative um, state. And plus there's one other part of this whole deal that's kind of skipped over is that there are people who need to go to this office. People who are immigrants, illegal or probably illegal, or people who are being processed by ICE. And if they don't show up, at this office on time and do the paperwork, then their whole proceedings are stalled. So there is a definite possibility that this protest is actually doing more harm than good. Though we'll see if the media attention picks up and if it becomes like an Occupy ICE thing, um, similar to the Occupy Wall Street movement. Now, one other thing about this General Assembly of ICE installation prost protesters. I sat there through the general meeting and I, I noticed that there was that progressive stack starting to happen where people were saying that, you know, people of color, their voices are centered. Their voices need to be first. And then somebody who was transgender is like, well, the transgender people, and there's only like 80 people there. So I wonder exactly how many trans people are, are in this population at this ice installation, but they're not feeling heard. And so it seems like the group has to spend a lot of time and energy making sure that certain groups are heard and represented and followed, right? And I'm like, okay, well, let's see how that works out for you. But then at, but then at the end of the meeting, they're like, you know what? There's not enough white bodies here. We need white liberal allies here. You know, white liberals, they have their problems, but we need them here because we're running out of steam and we're getting really tired doing all this work. And it's been a week and we need to, uh, you know, be ready for the long haul or whatever. And it was just interesting to see that the progressive stack still relies on a, a base. It relies on that pyramid, relies on a very firm, rich base of basically, in this instance, white people to come there, donate their money, donate their time, donate their, I guess, their obedience, and donate their ability to not speak and just do what they were told. That was interesting. And there, so I think Antifa has something to do with that, and the Socialist Party in Portland has something to do with that, but uh, kind of along the same uh, I guess thematic principle that of that which animates the uh, progressive movement in Portland, there was also a protest for Jordan Peterson planned. And that that happened. I, I, we got there 
we got in line, me and my friends, we got in line to the, for the Jordan Peterson event, and there were people, um, and they're shouting. And there was, oh man, there's barely 20 protesters, and there was about 3,000 Jordan Peterson viewers or audiencers. And the protesters, they were shouting this and they're shouting that. Uh, you got to look up Andy knows. Well, I guess we can do this. There was a sign that said infinite genders. He just said that. Infinite genders. I don't know if that's a proclamation or some sort of request or just like a new flavor of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Infinite genders. And my question is, is that if something is infinite, it's no longer a category. So you just want an infinite amount of categories, which basically says that you don't want a category to be there. So why would you need gender in the first place if you want to abolish gender? So it just seems kind of contradictory to me. And then there was stuff about, you know, uh, hey, hey, ho, ho, uh, you know, white, no violent men or something like that. Okay, let's look this up. Let's look. Andy, Andy, no. Sweet guy. I'm going to not bother him, but I'm going to try to get him on my show because he's got some, I, I really like his viewpoint and he's got some cool stories too. Uh, let's go at his Twitter. Infinite genders, they were shouting. As many genders as we want. My body, my choice. Can you hear that? We don't need your hate and lies. Fight for justice, organize. And they're just kind of yelling at a building with people lining up. They're just yelling at a building. Then we went inside to the Jordan Peterson talk, the lecture by Jordan Peterson. And it was interesting. Um, it was interesting. I don't know why he started talking about this, but he started talking about YouTube. For the first 10, 15 minutes, he was just talking about YouTube. He did this long preamble. And um, and I don't know why, because it, it seemed like the more he went into that, the more and more uh, uh, speciality he was talking about. But he did open it up to kind of try to show or to, to state that there is a sea change in communication. And he talks about TV. And he talks about how TV uh, has gatekeepers and uh, the the influence the commercial influence on TV makes everything very short and you know you have a six minute time span at the best if you're a thinker to be on TV and be exposed to millions of people you have six minutes right and then the internet comes along and podcasts come along and Joe Rogan has three hours for people to talk and to explore these ideas. And, you know, and also he talked about Netflix and how we're Netflix or, or the, uh, the streaming on demand uh, way of communicating or sharing media, let's say, allows for novel grade television to occur, like very long, uh, complex stories, narratives, characters to take place over time. And then we can just shotgun them into our brains. Um, and Jordan Peterson, he went on at length at that and it made me feel pretty good about what I'm doing because, you know, you start talking to people who don't know you. They're like, well, what do you do? I'm like, well, I'm on YouTube. And like, well, you make money off of that? I'm like, well, not much, but I do make some and I see people can make more. So that's what I'm doing, you know, but I always feel a little like, well, I mean, it's not a real job, you know, uh, it's not a real job until I have a million followers and $600,000 a month on Patreon or whatever. That's, that's when it becomes a real job. Right. But, but even if it's not a real job, what I'm doing here can still be real work, right? Insofar as I'm giving people something that they want and trying to take this medium and seeing what I can add to the medium and, and make a unique mark, this can be unique work, whether or not it's a, a, a real job or not, you know. Um, and then he went on to other things and he had, it was, I saw him, I saw Jordan Peterson at the Seattle Moore Theater, and I saw him uh, last month, and then I saw him yesterday in Portland. And for whatever reason, I th think that his talk at the at the Keller Auditorium in Portland was better. And I think that that had to do something with, uh, it had something to do with two things. One, on just a purely aesthetic level, I like the Kelly Auditorium a little bit more. I mean, it wasn't as artistic, it wasn't as cozy as the Moore Theater, but it was cleaner and it was bigger and it was broader and it was wider. Um, and it felt like uh, it, it was more professional setting for him. And I think that that might have a way, something to do with 
the quality that I felt aesthetically overall about his talk. But the other thing that had happened is that he had just gotten done with two two and a half hour talks or debates with Sam Harris. And apparently they were doing this whole tousle over what is truth and what is reality and what are facts and what is meaning. And he very recently, the last few days, just this past, maybe even just this past weekend, he had a tousle with Sam Harris. And I think that really got him really thinking really hard about what he's trying to do, what he's trying to communicate. And I noticed something has been shifting with him and I, I and I think that this is good and this is just my perception I don't watch everything of Jordan Peterson I can only watch so much but I I have a feeling that he is he's easing back on the polemic he's not attacking as much anymore he doesn't go after postmodernism or feminists so much anymore. And somebody asked him pointedly about um, about what do we do about the protesters outside? And David Rubin was a little snarky about it, you know, called them losers or whatever. It was soy boys. What do you do with the soy boys outside? And Jordan Peterson, he, I, I, I'm sure he said this before, and if you watch him, you'll probably see it. You'll probably have heard him say this before. But he said that, you know, speaking of America, you know, 50% of America votes Republican and 50% of America votes Democratic. You know, so there's there's a consistent for the last 20 years. This is Jordan Peterson. I'm just parroting him. For the last 20 years, our country has been split in half in how we in the patterns of our voting, and so basically we need to start communicating to the other people. They're in our heads. They're in our lives. We cannot run away. We cannot vilify them. If we go along the road of vilification, it's going to end up in disaster. Right. And I agree with that. I, I really do agree with that. And then that's that kind of, I guess I can bring that back to kind of the state that I'm in right now about like my main story, like Evergreen. Like, what do I do with Evergreen? Um, what, what have I done with Evergreen? I'm looking back and I'm feeling kind of bad about having been hard on people. Right. And I know that, well, okay. There's the Benjamin that comes up here and he goes through his moodiness and he can make fun of people and be respectful or like kind of be overly apologetic or kind of overly rude and he's always changing, right? And there's entertainment value in that. And I understand that. I'm not apologizing for the entertainment value, but I'm I'm wary of the negative effect. If I'm I I just keep on thinking that the people at Evergreen that I talk about, they're real people, they're actual people. Their actions, I firmly disagree with. Their belief structure, I think, is absolutely toxic. My job is to explain exactly why it's toxic and to kind of justify why I think that their actions are um, not at all commendable. But, you know, I want them to be treated as human beings because I lose my own humanity when I'm not treating people as human beings. I diminish my own nobility by treating people ignobly. And, and the, the, the problem with that is that, you know, what happens when people aren't acting nobly? I have to call that out, you know? And, and there was something that Jordan said about the truth and, you know, what is free speech? Why is free speech so important? And he, and he went on this long, um, kind of twisty, turvy adventure into his free speech argument. And, and he talks about how if we cannot speak about what is going on, then one, we're all going to be stuck in our own ignorance, and two, nothing can be fixed. We cannot come on the truth and uh, come upon the truth. And, and he, he goes on this long rant about how we're all flawed and partial, and so what we need is to rely on each other in order to come to the truth together. And I think his, his truth is a very utilitarian truth. His truth is, what do we do? How do we maintain something or how do we build something new? Um, uh, basically to break it down into the dichotomy that he uses with the uh, liberal and the conservative. The liberal invents and the conservative maintains. And so I think that, that communication, speaking, is a way to ensure when something needs to be changed and when something needs to uh, be maintained. And, and in what way do we change and maintain things? Um, so. <clears throat> to go back to my evergreen thing, I can't stop talking about it. I need to figure out a way that I can talk about it. Well, 
I have to be passionate or else I don't want to do anything. So I need the passion there. Whether the passion is anger or, or hilarity or, uh, or curiosity or any of the number of things that animate me. If I'm not animated, I'm not going to go along that road. So I need to figure out my N into, you know, I feel like I want to finish up the Evergreen story, even though there's a lot of things that are going to happen. There's a lot of things that are going to happen at Evergreen. Evergreen has not failed yet. And no, it's not going to be like some napalm, you know, sky god come down and like just demolish it. No, it's going to be a very painful, painful process of either, of either complete death or rebirth. And I don't know which way it's going to go, but it's going to be painful. And I know there's a lot of things that coming down the pipes that's going to force it to change. And there's a lot of unanswered questions. There's questions I cannot answer. Why is George Bridges still there? How can a president who's being paid $300,000 a year cost a college now $7 million? And, you know, there's extingent circumstances, but it was the protests and how he handled that. And then everything that came out that I've kind of brought to light about the place. And what is he doing to actually fix that stuff? He lies. George Bridges lies, right? That's something that I can't stand. And I feel okay being mad about that and saying, you know what, you might be a good person, but you're lying and we can't stomach that. We can't do that. So I don't know. So there you go. This was a completely worthless episode other than you to get to experience me and me to get to experience me and to remind myself that this is something that I do do and that I need to continue to do and to, uh, to figure out what to do with this that I am doing. So, so th uh, that said, um, there's uh, some really cool interviews that I'm really excited about coming out um, very sh shortly in the next week and so or so. And, uh, and you guys probably missed my cats, but I just saw something that I thought was really cute and special today. So we're going to show you this other thing. It's still an animal, critters, creatures, but they're not the cats. All right. Good night.